All right, so today, they were approaching the concept of linear functions. We want to graph this. I want to take a look if we can take a look and see uh, what this looks like on a graph, see if we can find the slope and the y-intercept here. And let's uh, does anyone know where to start this problem? Oh, over there. Oh, yeah. Why is graphing important? Why is graphing important? Really? Stupid. 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 I, have I told you about graphing before? Dan, well, let me, well let, me, let me tell you a few things because this is key. Do you realize that, um, you know, let, me, let, me, let me share the interesting quote. Do you know who Galileo is? Yeah, anyone know who Galileo is? Who's Galileo? Astronomer, Astronomer mathematician, physicist, philosopher, <laughs> around 1600s or so. He had some interesting quotes. Let me share, let me share some things with you. He, he said this about, about math. It's really weird. I don't know why he said this. He said, mathematics is the language which, with, with which God has written the universe. And whether or not whether you believe in God, this interesting quote to think about why he would say that. Number two, he says, nature's great book is written in mathematics. What's interesting, Dan, when we think about mathematics, when we learn math, we seem to be learning this, this language, other than English that we speak, this language that used to describe all sorts of things around us. Things that, it's a language that when we think about everything from me getting into a, a race and taking off and sprinting down, it looks like I'm running, but I can use math as a language. I can use graphs to, to represent what's happening and analyze that situation in a way that my eyes can't do it. Math can tell me my acceleration speed, how far I'm going to be going at a certain speed, when, I'm gonna, you know, when I reach maximum speed. It gives me a language to use. In fact, nature seems to be written in this language of mathematics. It's pretty cool. We see visual things like this, and things seem to work, right? The planets seem to stay in order, right? Two planets haven't collided yet, as far as I know. Have you guys heard of that yet? We see, we see, things, uh, we see things down at the, all these different levels that just seem to always seem to work. Flowers continue to bloom. Things seem to happen. But it's pretty cool to think about. Beyond our eyes, there's a language that describes a lot of why this works, what happens in nature and in, in our world. And it's mathematics. Mathematics gives us a way to talk about, well, how can we chart the position of those planets and figure out where they are going, when they're going to be there, their speed, how do they relate to one another? If we're going to launch that space shuttle, mathematics gives us a language to put all these things in order and get a place where we know, where we know exactly, we can, we, it's not random. Nature's not random. We look at the growth of bacteria and we think, is it random? Does it just happen however? Well, we'd study mathematically. Math gives us a language to understand exactly how that process works, to make predictions, to, to figure out how it relates to other things, to look at the type of relationship it has, the graphs, the equations, the, it all comes together. It's this language that we use. So we see these things with our eyes, but it's pretty cool to think about behind what our eyes don't see. There's math. Math, again, we look at the language of mathematics, and all of a sudden, the same things we see with our eyes become a language that we can test and try and use to accomplish other things and to study. It's pretty awesome to feel like, <laughs> as we learn this language, we're unlocking some of the secrets of nature, the language that is written, the, the world seems to be written in. It's pretty cool. Um, in fact, let me share one neat story with you, just a, one example. There's this island in Hawaii called Mauna Loa. It's a volcano. It's the largest volcano by volume, I think, in the world. And traditionally, it's been used for a place to, to, as an observatory, to go on top and take a look at, at things that are happening. And, 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 you know, lately you've heard of all this, uh, greenhouse uh, effect and warning about our, our, our Earth's, Earth's temperature and are we being good stewards of the Earth and things? Well, those are just questions, but how do we answer those questions? It's mathematics. We answer the question with mathematics. For example, what if we put up some, some type of device on top of the mountain and recorded carbon dioxide levels? And so here's a table of carbon dioxide levels from 1958 to the present of looking at season round, month by month by month. Again, math, all of a sudden we have numbers that describe a process. We couldn't even see with our eyes, but now we have numbers to tell us a story about what was happening with the carbon dioxide. And what if we take those numbers, Dan, and we use the language of graphs to put it to a graph, and we can take a look. In fact, if you see this red graph here, it's interesting. This is the carbon dioxide levels. And oh my goodness, this is a pretty wild pattern. Why is it doing that? <laughs> well, we realize that basically around the year, carbon dioxide does cycle naturally with the seasons and things. Certain seasons, plants produce more carbon dioxide or less, so you kind of get this cyclical function. But if you look at it, See how each year it seems like it's going up? You still get the seasonal cycles, but we see this trend going up. And again, this language of math gave us a story. It gives us some, something to go from, something to talk about. So why do we learn math, Dan? Well, I guess we want to speak this language. We want to know what's happening. We want to be informed. We want to be able to make good decisions. We want to be able to understand how do we a answer life's big questions. And math is what language we can do that with. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. Uh, quick little plug here, a little shameless plug here for my, my soapbox this time. Things like Mauna Loa and things like graphing, I, I think that when we think about when we try and make in, more real life connections with mathematics, I, I, I strongly believe that data is the way we really, we've got to go because data, we can take all sorts of real world situations and, and, and take it into the classroom, have students graph it and look at the functions and use regression. I think regression is such a powerful tool in mathematics that sometimes we, we short change. Sometimes our textbooks wait until the final, very end of the chapter, and then you get like a day on regression at the very end to plug in some data, get a function that matches it, and oh look, isn't that neat. I strongly believe that we need to use more things like regression earlier with students, not later, to set it up. Let them see some real life applications. Let them see how, how the data fits certain functions differently, and let's use those functions to make predictions, to try and analyze different situations. I think we're not doing it justice right now in a lot of curriculums. More data, more regression, more using that to, 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 to help students see connections between, between what we're doing. You know, there's a lot of, there's, this, this session is not about curriculum. There's definitely certain curriculums that you look at and they, they do a better job connecting one thing to the other. But I strongly believe no matter what the curriculum is, we as teachers have choices. I mean, the session is about, we all teach mathematical content, but I think how we teach it and what we choose to emphasize is gonna make a world of difference. I'm a big believer in NCTM's five process standards that no matter what the math content is that you feel like maybe you're forced or not forced to teach, I think we all feel that way sometimes, that there's certain things you'd rather not teach, maybe you feel like you have to. But we think about emphasizing those five process standards of, of communication, students communicating ideas, you know, orally and in writing, you know, making connections between mathematical topics and between the real world. Think about different representations that students can, can look at and make and, and think about. Students reasoning skills to reason out why things are true and justifying, justifying what's true in math and problem solving, giving students real problems where there's not an apparent answer right away. And, and yes, they kick back on that, but chance to, to actually put to use and try and uh, raise curiosity, to actually make them think that math is more than just memorizing and repeating, that math is a tool to answer questions. So I need to have a question I don't know how to answer. If that's where what math is, I gotta give my students questions they don't know how to answer. And not just leave them to fail, but you know, scaffold with them and be with them al along with them. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I just think we have choices to make that can send different messages in the classroom.